Latin from scratch, as I promised in the last class, now we have the syntax of participles. In the previous class, we studied the morphology and the basic way to translate each of the uh, three most common participles. But now we have to study the syntax of participles, taking, uh, taking into account the different functions they can have. Okay, And here we see the uh, table of contents, the basic syntax, then the participle as predicate, the ablative absolute. This is super important, okay? Ablative absolute. And then inside the ablative absolute, we have more things, etc. Okay, so we'll see. First, basic syntax. Just like adjectives, we said that participles are verbal adjectives. So they are adjectives. Okay, so just like adjectives, participle must agree in gender, number, and case. Okay, so gender, number, and case. Gender, number, and case with the noun they refer to. So this is super normal, super, again, we know this. Also, participles can be nominalized or have their own complements. Nominalized, what does this mean? That a participle, which is an adjective, can work as a noun. Okay, but, okay. Or have their own complements, because, after all, yes, participles are adjectives, but they come for, uh, from verbs, and verbs can have complements. So also, participles can have their own complements in the same way that verbs have complements. Okay? There are two main constructions, participle as predicates and the ablative absolute. Now, small disclaimer, this participle as predicates, uh, I couldn't really find the name for this in English. So this is my best translation. If you find something else, somewhere else, uh, then probably it is better <laughs> than this. But I mean, it is just a name, okay? It's just a tag. Uh, but, uh, okay. Participle as predicate. These participles appear as the predicate of any noun in the sentence in any syntactic function. Since the participle agrees with the noun, the participle can appear in any case. Any case, because it, it, uh, the noun it refers to can have any function. So, for example, if the noun the participle refers to is a um, direct object, it is in the accusative case. So, the noun is in the accusative, so the participle is also in the accusative, because it has to agree in case, number, gender. Okay? That's what this means. Most of the times, these participles can be directly translated into English, usually right after the noun they refer to. If the participle has complements, these go after the participle. Now, uh, here it is kind of important to respect the uh, order of the words, because you know that English has a very strict, or quite strict, order of words, whereas Latin is kind of the opposite. Like in Latin, like words can be like even like lines away from each other okay so um, it is um, good to take this into account so for example here we have interview stellas non videmus solis luce obscuratas okay so here we have a participle we can translate this as during the day we don't see the stars darkened by the light of the sun this is like kind of a direct translation no so, here, obscuratas, and we see it is accusative, plural, feminine. So, uh, because it agrees with stellas, which is accusative, plural, feminine. And then here you see that the participle is quite far, it's quite far from the noun it refers to. But in English, we kind of have to translate it immediately after. Okay, so during the day, we don't see the stars darkened by the light of the sun. And here we also see Luke is uh, an ablative, which is, um, as we said in the uh, passive voice, that um, better than um, agent it would be the cause, okay? Because looks, look is the light, is not a person. 
So it is kind of weird to say that it is an agent. So it is the cause. The cause why uh, stars are darkened. Okay? So, of course, this is the cause of the participle. It is not the cause of the main verb. Okay? It is the cause of this. Hmm? So, participles, as we said, can have their own complements. And because this is a passive participle, it's in the passive voice, then it can have even the typical complements of the passive voice. Okay, so that is the participle as a predicate. That is, a participle which agrees with any other word in the sentence in their case. And of course, case, gender, number. Okay, so that's the participle as predicate. Like, it can refer to anything, etc. Now, the ablative absolute, which actually is much more common than the previous one. And as we can assume, we can guess, it is always in the ablative case. Okay? So, ablative absolute participles, mostly perfect, that is, mostly they appear like the perfect participle. Also, the present participle can appear in the ablative absolute, but most of the times, like 90% of the time, it is a perfect participle. Only appear in the ablative case, always without a preposition. If we have something which looks like an ablative absolute, but it has a preposition, then it is not an ablative absolute. It is the previous one, a participle as a predicate, which happens to be in the uh, ablative case. But it is not an ablative absolute, because ablative absolute is a special structure. We are going to see. Both the participle and the noun it refers to, as well as the complements the noun and or the participle might have, make up a syntactic unit, which is syntactic unit, a phrase, we could call it also. A syntactic unit, which is independent from the rest of the sentence, and it has the meaning of an adverbial subordinate clause. And you see, it is in italics. It has the meaning of an adverbial, uh, an adverbial subordinate clause, but it is not a, a subordinate clause. It is an uh, independent syntactic unit. Okay? Okay. The translation of these constructions can be a bit tricky in English since a literal translation often feels artificial, clunky, or too formal, etc. So, let's see. Here we have this example Cognita militum voluntate ariminum cum ea legione proficiscit, which is Literally, the wishes of the soldiers being known, no, the wishes, I mean, here in Latin it is singular, but in English we would say it in plural, no, the wishes of the soldiers being known, he heads for Rimini with this legion. Okay, so how would we um, analyze this? We would say, just because you see that militum is the uh, complement of the noun of this. And then we just say ablative absolute. And that's it. We don't, uh, we don't write anything more, okay? We don't because in some grammar, some teachers, etc., they might say, no, the noun is the, the, the subject and the participle is the verb. No, we don't do that, okay? We don't. Uh, like they would say that this is the subject and this is the verb and this would be an um, uh, adverbial subordinate clause. No, okay? We don't do that because that is wrong, okay? We just say that this is an ablative absolute. We don't say what each of these is and inside the ablative absolute, if this refers to the noun, then we, we can mark it, it's fine. And then imagine that also the participle has uh, some complement, like before, so we can also mark it. But we don't say that this is the subject and this is the verb. No, just ablative absolute. Then, um, here we have the literal translation. Um, well, you are the native, but I would say that this sounds kind of like artificial, not the wishes of the soldiers being known. Hmm? 
For example, we could also say, having learned the wishes of the soldiers, etc., or after learning the wishes of the soldiers, etc. Now, I said, the ablative absolute has a perfect participle most of the times, but it can also have a present participle. So, for example, Pythagoras Tarquino Regnante in Italian when it, which by the way, it should, uh, it should be, I, I don't know, maybe I copied this wrong, but it should be Pythagoras, no? like in English, no? uh, of course, like Latin, writing from Greek, etc. No? So Pythagoras uh, Tarquino Regnante, so here we have this uh, present participle in Italian when it. so Pythagoras Tarquin reigning, like that would be the literal translation again, no? Pythagoras, Tarquin reigning, came to Italy. Now, Pythagoras, Tarquin being king, okay, a bit better maybe, and now, during the reign of Tarquin, more natural. Okay, so again, we have to uh, be careful with the best translation, the context, etc. Now, important, ablative absolute without participle, and this might sound kind of counterintuitive because we said that an ablative absolute needs a participle and now we are saying without participle. Okay, let's see. It is not uncommon actually, it is kind of frequent to find an ablative absolute without its participle. This is because the present participle of the verb sum, which does not exist in Latin, is assumed. So, pretty much. In Latin, the verb sum, to be, doesn't have a participle, at least classical Latin, of course, like later Latin, medieval Latin, etc., kind of makes up the participle, but in classical, like old Latin, uh, doesn't have uh, the participle of the verb sum, the present participle of the verb sum. So, of course, if it doesn't exist, you cannot use it. Hmm? In our translations, it is possible to use the English being or translate in any other uh, freer way. We'll see. Now, there are a few frequent types. First, public office. The name of a person, or referring to a person, together with a noun related to public office or similar, in the ablative case without a preposition, will be an ablative absolute. Okay, the most typical examples would be this one, no? Cicerone et Antonio Consulibus. Oh, here we, we have name or names of people, and then another noun which refers to public offer, uh, offer office. Okay, so here we uh, lack the participle of the present sum, but we have to assume it. Okay, so Cicero and Antony being consul. Okay, so being consul. And here you see that, uh, and this happens kind of often also, like we can have Cicerone Antonio Consulibus, because this is like a formula which is repeated a lot, no? like, because you might know already that in Latin they didn't have um, this year before Christ, because Christ didn't, had, hadn't been born yet. You know? So they didn't count from Christ. They counted, uh, of course, from the foundation of Rome, but then they called each year with the name of the two consuls which were in charge that year, and kind of like everybody knew. Mm? So, for example, if I say, Cicerone Antonio Consulibus, that means the year in which Cicero and Antony were consuls. And I already know, because I was a Roman and I was in the world, I know which year it was, okay? Uh, so this is a very frequent formula, and you know that formulas can have like this syntax, which is a bit weird, like, uh, for example, it is quite common, as I was saying, to say just Cicerone Antonio Consulibus. But this is not that there is one person whose name is Cicero Antony, no. We assume the et. Sometimes the et is there, some other times it is not there, but we have to assume it. And how do we know? Because sometimes they actually say just the name of one consul. 
So how do we know that this is Cicero and Anthony and not Cicero Anthony? Not because of the et, but because consulibus, plural. So that means that these are two different people. If it was consule, singular, then it would be one consul whose name is Cicero Anthony. Okay? I think I explained myself. Um, it is not so hard. So, uh, literally, it would be Cicero and Anthony being consuls. Now, in a freer way, we can translate during the consulship of Cicero and Anthony. Okay? Then, uh, other example, for example, here, no? Antonio Praetore. Anthony being uh, Praetor. When Anthony was Praetor, etc. Now, even Duque Illo. This is not exactly public office, or maybe, yes, it's like not... Mm, mm, but Duque Illo. So, he being general, or since he was the general, etc. Okay? In each uh, example, we have to find the best translation possible. And this is the most frequent, um, most of the times, this, consulibus or consul. Okay? This and this being consuls, or in the consulship, during the consulship of this and this. Guys, no? Now, we can also have something similar. It is pretty much the same when we have a noun referring to a stage of life. So, for example, me puedo. So, me being a child, that is, when I was a child or since I was a child, etc., etc. Again, depends on the context. And then, adjectives such as invitus. An adjective such as invitus, invita, invitum, can appear in a similar structure. Invitus has to do with, vitus has to do with English will, no? Like, um, yeah, so with English will. And now, in vitus means against my will, no? Or against whosoever will, no? So, me in vitu, that would be against my will. Depends on the person here, it will be against whosoever will, okay? Uh, that's it. Okay, so this is all the theory we need to know about the participles. I know there is a lot of theory, the uh, relative time, the morphology, the syntax, all that we have explained about the syntax. Um, in my experience as a teacher, uh, participles are kind of hard to get and to identify in sentences and to translate them correctly, etc. So, of course, what we have to do now is go and practice.